Good afternoon, YouTubers. This is Army Truck Josh. I'm going to give you a tour of the inside of my 1967 M35A2 military deuce and a half. I'm going to start by showing you that there is no door locks on a deuce and a half, nor are there any keys whatsoever. Um, the only way to lock it is if you are inside the cab and you pull the handle down. Pulling the handle down causes the doors to lock. Don't do it if you're outside the vehicle because you will lock yourself out. Now, it is quite a climb up. It's about four feet from the ground, so you do have a higher vantage point. So up in the cab, you can see just about anything around you. I installed a rear view so you can see straight out the back. You can see there, straight back down there on the bubble mirror. That mirror is cracked, but it doesn't matter, you can still see. It shows you everything over the back of the, uh, the bed. If you look out that way, there's another bubble mirror you can see directly to the right of the vehicle, and then the other one you can see further back. So, there really isn't any blind spots. You can check out the back window and see how your cargo is doing if you need to. This is a hard top, so you don't have the same visibility as a soft top, but uh, it works. Uh, you can actually see your front bumper there. If you look over this way, you can almost see it. You can see the uh, front marker light there. And this is all just from the driver's seat. This is exactly what I can see from where I'm sitting. Um, I can show you the steering wheel. I am missing my horn button. My horn does not work in general at all anyway. I tested it. The solenoid's gone out, so I'm going to order a whole new system. Um, normally there's a big rubber button there. And it is like a train-style horn, so it it makes quite a racket. Um, I'm going to go down here show you this gate or this switch switchboard I guess you would call it. Uh, starting at the top, this is your accessory switch. To start the vehicle you need to turn that and then down on the other side of the column there's a red button that you would push to start. Again, no keys in a deuce and a half. It's just push and go. Uh, when you're done, after you park it, let it idle. It's five minutes. I'll explain that a little bit later. Let it idle. Turn your fuel and accessory switch off and pull the throttle stop or the engine stop. And this does lock in place, but it's hard to find the spot. You don't need to. Just pull it until your engine stops running. And that'll shut her off. This down here is a hand throttle for colder days, which I really don't have a whole lot of here in Florida. Um, if you pull the hand throttle out, it will rev the engine at whatever intensity you pull it out at. Um, it's connected directly to the same throttle that your foot throttle is. This down here is your flame heater. This is a manifold heater. Um, it's a little injector with a spark plug that lights a little fire inside your, uh, inside your manifold to warm up the engine in cold climates. Doesn't get too cold here, don't need it, so I actually cut the cable or cut the lines and capped it off because it was leaking a little bit. Right on my turbocharger causing a large smoke screen to come up behind me. Wasn't very pleasant. A lot of it came up in the cab as well because it's a military vehicle and there are lots of points where it can breathe into the cab. Uh, this here is your right here is your light switches. This is the lock for the light switch. None of this will turn more than a notch that direction to uh, turn on your blackout lights. And that's the only way it'll turn without that latch. If you flip this latch and push this way, that is your regular driving lights. That gives you your turn signals, brakes, and markers. If you turn it another notch, it gives you headlights. Now your bright switch is down here on the floor. You got a little foot button, and uh, that's how you change high to low. Um, you can turn it back off. You don't need to push the switch to turn it off, just to turn it on. If you want to turn on your blackouts, you go all the way to the right with that. After pushing this, again, it locks it. This will give you your blackout lights, including the small cat eye light up front. It doesn't give you a whole lot of illumination just enough that you can barely see to drive. It's made so that you don't get shot at in a war zone. This here will turn your dash lights on bright, low, and off. If you're in blackout, you can flip it down and it'll turn your dash lights on also. Alright, underneath that there's a little valve. This is actually your wipers. A lot of times it's not marked. This one actually says Thyco on it. Made in the USA, that's all it says. If you open it up, just like a regular valve, like you're taking a top off, 
it gives you air to your wipers. Now you can hear they're probably pretty loud. Um, they are pneumatic. They run off of air. Um, up here is your actual wiper unit. There's a little thing that you can actually run it by hand. That is your mist setting because they don't go very slow. This is a release right here. You push that and it lets any air out so that you can push it up to the side so that it's not directly in your field of vision. Um, I did install that mirror. Um, another thing that a deuce and a half does not have is air conditioning unless you installed it. It's about a $2,000 installation. Personally, I don't think it's worth it. Um, especially since I can come down here, I can kick out the side vent. My side vent allows me to have some air circulation down by my feet. It works great because it pops out down here. Let's see if I can't get a shot of that. It pops out down there and it actually funnels air in. So that works well as air conditioning. Close that back up. And then you also have windows. Your windows pop out up front and they open all the way. So you have the ability to open up so it's almost like a convertible only better because it funnels the air in here and you have coverage from the sun up top. Uh, both sides do that. There's a kick pedal over there also. Um, you can see that my floor pan does need a little refinishing. Not sure where I'm going to go. I might go with Duracoat. I might uh, actually go to uh, Rhino Line it. Okay, over here. Again, this is your start and switch. When you flip that accessory switch on and push that, it'll turn the engine over and fire it up as long as everything's working correctly in the engine compartment. This here is your air indicator, uh, or air filter indicator. It tells you when your air filter needs to be changed. There is a release on the top, so it will reset it if you need to. For example, if you put your hand in front of it, this will turn red, telling you that your air filter's bad. It's because there's not enough air flow going through it. That's how it runs. Um, as long as it's green, you should be good to go. Just check your air filter now and then, because when I first got this, there was a huge hole in it. Which, I'm assuming, probably wasn't very good. Um, down here, you have your air, uh, your air damper for your heat. You must open this in order to run your heat over here. You have a high and low setting, which, either way, uh, high is really warm, and low is kind of warm. Don't really need it too high down here in Florida because it gets really warm once you get the engine up to temperature. Uh, this is your defroster damper. It opens up the damper that goes to the defrosters, which are up here. You can see these little vents here. They blow up on the windows. They work all right. They're not too bad. Um, they do work quickly, but they don't always defrost the whole windshield. Um, down here, this is your it's a pneumatic system for your uh, six-wheel drive. In is obviously to engage it, and out lets it loose. There's a gear that locks in and engages your front wheels. Uh, you got high beam indicators in your gauge cluster here. Those are just little lights that help light it up. Uh, these ones are actually red lenses, so they light up the gauges red. Um, this is your oil pressure. Should be right around 60 is normal. Sometimes it'll get a little higher if you're towing or going up a heavy hill. Um, moving to the right, you got your speedometer. Only goes to 60 because the truck doesn't usually go more than that. Unless you're going downhill with the wind to your back and the throttle on full. Uh, 10,454 miles on this engine. The engine was installed in 1983. Uh, it is a white multi-fuel diesel. It is turbocharged with the Whistler Turbo from uh, Schwitzer. To the right of that is your tachometer and your hour meter. You can see it's 373.8 hours. Um, and then all your uh, RPMs. Now that is in hundreds, so it's not going to tell you the thousands like a regular car. So it's 500, 10, or, uh, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000. You don't want to get it over 2,600 RPMs. It's, that's the red line on this vehicle. There's normally a sticker there saying danger. Um, I don't have that yet. I need to order one because I am trying to restore the vehicle. I'll probably do that after I paint everything. 
uh, the interior is going to get completely refinished just like the outside of the truck. This over here is your temperature gauge. You don't want it to fluctuate too much more than 170 there. That's that middle hatch mark. Uh, that's usually where my run's between 170 and 200. Anything over 200, it's time to start getting a little concerned. If it gets a lot over 200, I would stop, turn the machine off, let it cool down, and see if it does it again. If it does it again, you may have a serious problem. Uh, just south of that is your air compressor reading. Mine's sitting right around 120. Uh, the buzzer that you hear when you start the engine will go off at 60. That's so that you have your brakes. Um, if you don't let it go to 60, your brakes are going to be incredibly weak, and it's going to be very difficult for you to stop the 13,500 pounds of machine that is rolling down the highway at 50 miles an hour. Um, this here is your battery and generator meter. It should read in the yellow or just to the top side of the yellow when you are sitting still with the engine off. When the engine's on, it's going to go into that green section where it says generator, which is actually a form of alternator, but uh, it's big, so they call it a generator. You can actually weld with the power from this machine, which I might show in a later video. Um, that is in volts, by the way. To the left of that, you have your fuel meter, or fuel gauge. Mine does not work. It either says full or empty. Um, my tank is not full, and my tank is not empty. Somewhere in between, it's not going to tell me that. Um, <laughs> that's funny. There goes a guy in a mud truck. Anyway, um, the fuel gauge in this doesn't work. It's okay, because I have... 50 gallons of fuel usually gets me about 500 miles, and I fill up every two weeks. So, I mean, I don't necessarily need a full tank every two weeks, but I usually top it off every two weeks. Uh, over here is actually your shifter, and I'll show you on the gate, on the, uh, I'm sorry, on the panels, on the, sorry, data plates, uh, exactly what the shift pattern is. Um, there is spring tension to the left, so in order to put it in first gear, you actually have to push against some spring tension and pull it back to first gear. I know usually first gear is forward, but forward here is reverse. You got first, you're going to come up, and then straight forward, that's second. Straight back is third. Up and over is fourth, and then straight forward is fifth. Alright, so you have five gears on the on this shifter. Then here is your actual... Um, I'm sorry. This is your uh, transfer case. So you have high range and low range. So you can shift that and that will give you a different uh, gearing for the transfer case. Um, again, I'll show you the data plates now. This one over here has all your uh, information on your speeds and your shifting. And you can see the shift pattern there on your right. Um, your transfer case information. And it tells you what speeds you do and do not want to switch into and which gears. Like I said before, it is a multi-fuel engine. These are the authorized fuels by the military. And that would be diesel, gasoline. Um, it says mixing fuels is permissible. Uh, caution, do not use aviation grade gasoline. Reason being, a lot of aviation grade gasoline has alcohol in it. Alcohol will dry out your seals. It will ruin your engine. Um, I don't recommend using any ethanol based fuels. I don't recommend using any ethanol additives or alcohol additives. It will run off of it, but it will kill your engine eventually. Um, again, I usually run diesel in this. Sometimes a mix of diesel, used motor oil, some cooking grease here and there. It will burn just about anything you put in it. Um, just make sure you filter it pretty good first because it will clog up your filters and you'll be changing filters every couple of weeks. Not that fun. Also, you're going to want to make sure you drain those filters. Over here is all your information about your power takeoff and your winch operation. Uh, making sure that uh, you use that properly so you don't break any parts of your transmission. The top one tells you about uh, how the air system pressure is below the safe operating pressure. Uh, it should be determined immediately whether or not that buzzer is going off. It tells you if you are up to air pressure or not. Um, 
Again, it is a manual, so you have a clutch, a brake, and a throttle. Um, if you have any issues with them, check out underneath, because a lot of times the spring can either be disconnected or your tension rods between them, or your linkage rods, rather, might be uh, loose or not set properly. Because when I first got this, my throttle just stayed at the floor. Um, I had to actually put a bungee cord on it to pull it back all the way and attach it around the defroster there and um, it it just didn't work properly. The guy told me that the spring was broken I needed to get a new spring. Well I got up under the machine and there was a nut on the, the uh, linkage rod that just needed to be tightened up and it pulled the linkage rod a little bit shorter and tightened it up. There was no broken springs, there was nothing like that. I didn't need to buy anything. It cost me about 10 minutes worth of work. If you ask me, that's a lot better than paying for a spring. Um, on the floor here, just to the right of the driver's seat, you're going to have your uh, power takeoff clutch. Uh, you actually have to flip the, the little thing up to move it back and forth. I'm going to do this through the camera, it's not working. This is an access plate to the top of your transmission and all that. It's hard to see, but your brake bleeder goes in there. And you got all that other stuff. That just shuts down. Um, over there you got a glove box. Again, it does not lock. Yeah, power windows. Man powered. <laughs> um, again, down is lock, up is open. Don't lock it unless you're in the vehicle. So you can unlock it again. Um, sliding back window, hard top. You can see the seat belt system is just kind of bolted in. It's minimum requirements because it is a military vehicle and did not come with them originally. Uh, they came with mine because I bought it used from a private seller. I have a fire extinguisher. I think this is something important that all of these trucks should have within them because it's basically covered in grease, oil, and fuel all the time, and it gets hot. So those things, if you have any type of brain, will you will know that they will cause a fire at some point in time. I try to keep it as clean as possible, but if it's not leaking, it's not running right. That's what I was always told about these machines. Um, I did install a little console down here, which works great for keeping my drinks from falling over because aside from that console there is nowhere to put a drink in this. Um, I also have uh, you know wipes for my windshield when they get dirty and a bunch of other stuff in there. And some allen wrenches for adjusting things if I need to jump out and adjust something real quick. I have a flak vest behind the seat because it kind of goes with the truck. <laughs> Or, you know, you never know if you're going to have to get into an uh, artillery battle with someone. Um, I think that's about it for inside the cab. Um, I installed the mirror aftermarket. I'll step out and show you how the seats work real quick. Oh, I almost forgot. This would be your emergency brake lever. Mine doesn't function properly. That great. Anyway. Um, I'm going to order a new lever and a new linkage system for it. These are the spring seats. Some of them are just a box seat where this is all just a solid box that goes straight to the floor. This has a spring inside uh, and it's on like a cantilever type of system and it, it does bounce up and down as you're driving down the road. Not quite an air ride, but it is a spring system so it's a little bit more comfortable when you're on the off-road environment. This is supposed to be a tensioner. I don't notice a whole lot of difference. It's supposed to either tighten or soften that spring to make it uh, a little bit more comfortable for you. But like I said, I don't really see any difference. Um, this is adjusts it forward and backward. It only goes about two inches. This here adjusts this part up and down. And then there's another one behind this that adjusts this part up and down for whatever height you are. Um, the original factory fire extinguisher mount was there, but it didn't fit my extinguisher properly, so I didn't use it. Um, again, this is the tour of the cab of my 1967 M35A2, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. This is Army Truck Josh, signing off.